I look out over the audience this morning and uh, find reason to believe that uh, there are optimists within the congregation because there are, I believe that there are a few more here than ordinarily are when the football season is out on. And uh, reflecting the fact that some of you have hope since the Cowboys are playing out of town and early, you want to see that game, and you have some optimistic hope you're here. Well, we are here to encourage you and also to give you comfort and consolation through the Word of God so you'll be prepared to face what you may have to face a few hours from now. We're glad to have a little different composition of the congregation at 8.30. Well, we are studying the life of David, looking for lessons within it that may be applicable to us today and the day in which we live. So far as I know, there are none that really touch on the problem of the cowboys, especially, at least directly, but many other lessons that are useful for us. And we're turning to 1 Samuel chapter 22 and reading the chapter for our scripture reading. David, therefore, departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. So he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. Then David went from there to Mizpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and mother come here with you till I know what God will do for me. You may have been puzzled a little bit that David would leave the land and go to Moab, but you must remember that Ruth the Moabitess was in David's ancestry. And so he had relatives evidently there. And in addition, there were some other connections as well. When we had the first lesson, I believe, in David, we made comment upon the fact that David has a number of contacts with Gentiles, more than you might expect. And uh, this is one of the instances of it. The fourth verse, so he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. Now the prophet Gad said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold. Depart and go to the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Herith. When Saul heard that David and the men who were with him had been discovered, now Saul was staying in Gibeah under a tamarisk tree in Ramah, with his spear in his hand. Saul doesn't seem to have ever sat down without a spear or a javelin in his hand. And here again. And all his servants standing about him. Then Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Here now, you Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? All of you have conspired against me and there is no one who reveals to me that my son has made a covenant with the son of Jesse, and there is not one of you who is sorry for me or reveals to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as it is this day. Then answered Doeg the Edomite, who was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse going to Nob to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitab. And he inquired of the Lord for him, gave him provisions, and gave him the sword of Galath the Philistine. So the king sent to call Ahimelech, the priest, the son of Ahitab, and all his father's house, the priests who were in Nob, and they all came to the king. And Saul said, Here now, son of Ahitab. He answered, 
here I am, my Lord. Then Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, in that you have given him bread and a sword and have inquired of God for him, that he should rise up or rise against me to lie in wait as it is this day? So Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who among all your servants is as faithful as David, who is the king's son-in-law, who goes at your bidding and is honorable in your house? Did I then begin to acquire, inquire of God for him? Far be it from me. Let not the king impute anything to his servant or to any in the house of my father, for your servant knew nothing of all this, little or much. It's uh, to be noted that Doeg does not say anything in his replies to indicate to King Saul that Ahimelech was really innocent and uh, consequently did not know anything really that was going on and was actually a dupe of David's deception. And the king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. Then the king said to the guards who stood about him, Turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David, and because they knew when he fled and did not tell it to me. But the servants of the king would not lift their hands to strike the priests of the Lord. And the king said to Doeg, You turn and kill the priests. So Doeg the Edomite turned and struck the priests and killed on that day 85 men who wore a linen ephod. Now it's uh, likely, although it is not stated in Scripture, it's likely since Doeg was the head of the herdsmen of Saul that he had a little help in this because it does seem rather strange that the one man should kill 85 by himself. Also Nob, the city of the priests, he struck with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and nursing infants, oxen and donkeys and sheep, with the edge of the sword. Now one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitab, named Abatha, escaped and fled after David. And Abatha told David that Saul had killed the Lord's priests. So David said to Abatha, I knew that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have caused the death of all the persons of your father's house. Stay with me. Do not fear. For he who seeks my life seeks your life. And with me you shall be safe. May the Lord bless this reading of his word, and let's bow together in a moment of prayer. The subject for this morning as we continue our studies in the life of David is David the Outcast in History and Type. One of the things over which biblical students have questions and debates is the subject of typology. That is uh, the study of things that took place in Old Testament times that may be reflective of things that transpire in New Testament times and particularly in the ministry of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A lot of things have been written about typology that are true, and a lot of things have been written about typology that are false, and it is certainly true that some have overdone the resemblances that exist between God's actions in the Old Testament and God's actions in the New. There are, generally speaking, three things that characterize a biblical type, and these three things are historicity, that is, it must be something that actually occurred. Correspondence, that is, there must be some correspondence between, between the Old Testament type and the New Testament anti-type. And then in the nature of the case, there usually is a predictiveness 
that is reflected in the type in that it anticipates the New Testament antitype and fulfillment. Now, the word type simply means an illustration. That's all there is to it. It's not a special technical term. If one takes a concordance and looks up the New Testament instances in which the term is found, you'll find that's precisely what it means, simply an illustration. Types may be classified broadly and simply as persons in the Old Testament who are reflective of the New and especially of those that reflect our Lord, although there are types in the Old Testament that reflect other characters, such as Judas, as our Lord points out in his dealings with his own disciples. There are institutions, such as the tabernacle, that are reflective in many ways of the truths of the New Testament. And then, of course, there are events, such as the Exodus, which is itself illustrative of redemption from bondage. For Israel, it was, re for Israel, it was redemption from the bondage of the Egyptians in Egypt. For us, the Exodus is the release and redemption from the bondage of sin. So we're turning now to David the outcast in history and type and not setting forth what may be called absolute truth in suggesting that David in the cave in Adullam is a type in that respect, but suggesting that, that David is the outcast in history and type. I would like to suggest, therefore, and suggest just as a suggestion, that's all, not laying it down as biblical doctrine or Christian theology, for after all, we are in the realm of a little bit of speculation. I'd like to suggest that David in the cave of Adullam is a suggestive illustration of Christ in his present rejection. I don't think we have any doubt at all about the fact that David is a type of Christ. As king of Israel, the son of David reflects the coming king, the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the relationship is exceedingly close, and in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, for example, great stress is laid upon the fact that the greater son of David is the expected son of David set forth in the covenant that God made with David. Now, David then, if he is a type of Christ, in the cave of Adullam may well be an illustration of Christ in his present rejection, for David was the anointed king, but rejected. Saul was the king who had been anointed, but now has lost his kingship in the mind of God. David is the coming king, already anointed, but Saul is actually reigning. When I reflect on that, I think of passages in the New Testament such as John chapter 1 and verse 11 and 12. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God or the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so David in the cave of Adullam suggests illustratively the present King Jesus Christ in his rejection. David's followers are also a suggestive illustration of Christ's reception of his followers in the present age. You remember that in his ministry when Jesus sat down with those who were sinners, they said about him, the leaders in Israel, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. That's reflective of how they looked at him. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. It's very interesting in the Bible to look at the enemy's statements concerning Christ. As a matter of fact, they're a kind of a fifth gospel when in Mark chapter 6, 
the reference is made to our Lord in this way. Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? We find the enemies of our Lord expounding his true humanity and his origins according to Holy Scripture. When he was hanging upon the cross, the leaders in Israel said with reference to him, he saved others, himself he cannot save. And in the very fact that they referred to him hanging upon the cross as saving others was an acknowledgment of the effectiveness of the ministry of our Lord. So even if you listen to his enemies, you would have a gospel message concerning Christ. He saved others. He did save others. So they said. Now, in John chapter 11 and verse 50, we find another illustration for, of this when Caiaphas said with reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Now his words probably intended something else, but they actually came out in such a way as to underline precisely what he was doing. He was dying for the people. So when we look carefully at the Word of God, we are not surprised to find that in the Old Testament, the events adumbrate, that's a big word, I'm sure you all know what that means, foreshadow coming events. Now the reason for this is obvious because there is one God and He acts according to His being and He has one being and in all of His activities they are reflective of who and what He is essentially. So we shouldn't be surprised that things in the Old Testament reflect things in the New. Historicity, correspondence, and predictiveness are the things that have to do with biblical illustrations. Now, turning to our chapter, the historical situation you're familiar with if you've been listening or coming to our meetings on uh, Sunday. David has been called to the ministry to succeed Saul. He has, by virtue of the power of God, he said, relying upon the name of Jehovah, he has made his great conquest of Goliath, but that has produced conflict with King Saul, and consequently for a number of chapters now, this conflict has been described and will be for further chapters. And David, relying upon the Lord God, has been preserved from Saul's murderous intent toward him. In the last chapter, we saw that David is still simply son, little s, son, not the son capital, the son of David. And so consequently, David, in his declension, and described in chapter 21, reflects those of us who from time to time fall in our relationship with the Lord God. David has had to escape for his life, and now we read in chapter 22, verse 1 through verse 5, that David has found a cave in the little town of Adullam, and there he resides. Now that's the historical situation, and I'd like to now say a few words about the interpretation and ap application of the passage. When the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews expounds some of the typology that he saw in the Word of God, in the ninth chapter of his epistle, he discusses things that have to do with the ordinance and the sanctuary, and he makes a very interesting statement. As he's describing the tabernacle, he speaks about the golden censer, he talks about the Ark of the Covenant, he talks about the golden pot that had the manna, he even mentions Aaron's rod that budded and the tablets of the covenant. And above it, he says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 5, were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Isn't that interesting? The writer of the epistle of the Hebrews lets us know, it seems, that he could speak of those things in detail. 
Later on, he will talk about the veil of the tabernacle and will make a spiritual point in typology with reference to the veil. So we may gather from this that it would be possible for us to speak in great detail of the typical significance of many things in the Word of God. Now, we're going to look at the interpretation and application of the passage, and then we'll look at some of the things that have to do with the typology of it or the illustrative character of it. Now, David is an outcast in verses 1 through 5, and he is described as gathering men out of fellowship with Saul. They come under the aegis of the new king, and we read everyone that was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. So he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. So here are the discontented. They are those who are in, de in debt, and they are those who are in distress, and they gathered to David and acknowledge him as their captain. Now, I found an illustration of that in the fact that you and I, who really fill the bill perfectly, for speaking of our nature spiritually, we are the ones who are ultimately in distress. We are the ones who are ultimately in debt. And we are the ones who are discontented. And we have, by God's grace, been called to our captain, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But there's some other lessons here aside from that one. I'd like for you to notice that in verse 3 we read, David went from there to Mizpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and mother come here with you till I know what God will do for me. The protection of his own family. What an illustration that is of respect for one's family. In our day, we are beginning to lose that. I do not think it's so evident in our Christian homes, but nevertheless, it is evident there. When we read in the Word of God in the beginning of Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12, these words, honor thy father and thy mother, we have something that is a very significant, uh, great significance for us in our day. Let me read the words for you. I'm sure you're familiar with them. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord Jesus honored that particular statement. We read that in the early days of his ministry, when he went up to Jerusalem and gave evidence of the fact that he was the promised one, Nevertheless, we read, he went back to his home, and there he became subject unto his father and mother. Oh, how we have lost that in our society, and we have lost that in our Christian homes as well. He was subject to them. Of all the per people who should never have had necessity to be subject, apparently, you would say, Jesus of Nazareth. But nevertheless, he did have a necessity to be subject to them. That was part of his training as the Son of God, and he was subject to them. And even on the cross, as he's hanging on the cross, he turns to John and says, Behold your mother. And from that time on, Mary went home to be with his cousin John. So, what we find in the Word of God is this very significant underlining of our responsibilities as believing individuals or simply as human beings. Honor your father and your mother. A lesson for our children today, if there ever was one needed. Honor your father and your mother. Then David tells us about, or rather the author tells us about Doeg and the massacre of the priests. In verse 7, 
Then Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Here now, you Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? In American history, it is generally thought that President Jackson, Andrew Jackson, Jackson was the father of the spoils system. Well, he may have been the father of the spoils system in the United States, but he was not father of the spoils system. This is what Saul is talking about. He's saying precisely this. If you vote for me, I'll give you all of these things. If you don't vote for me, I won't give them to you. This is one lesson in the Word of God that should not have been learned, which our politicians have beautifully learned. If they could learn the other lessons of the Word of God the way they have learned this one, then we would have a marvelous society. But notice Saul is still the individual who is something of a paranoid, has all the elements of hell within them, within him. He says, will the son of David give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? All of you have conspired against me. And so here, Saul's sin leads to more Irrationality becomes characteristic of him. He's like Herod the Great. When Herod the Great feared after hearing that the wise men came from the east, Scripture says he was troubled when he heard the reports. I think he was a manic depressive, afflicted with that kind of psychosis. And Saul evidently has much of the same thing. Herod the Tetrarch later on when uh, the Lord Jesus, after having killed John the Baptist, when the Lord Jesus came on the scene and began to perform his miracles, do you remember what Herod said? John the Baptist is risen from the dead. So that's characteristic of those who do not pay attention to the Word of God. Their sin leads to, leads to irrationality and finally to madness. And ultimately, that's precisely where sin takes us. Doeg the Edomite, an individual outside the land, illustrative of those who are outside the saving ministry of the Lord God, a professor of religion, but one who does not understand spiritual things, one who happened to be where David was, and David says later he feared when he saw his face in uh, Achish that... Uh, or in, in the land where Achish was, that uh, trouble might come from it. Slay the priests, King Saul says in verse 17, and he sinks deeper from disobedience. He sins ultimately into open rebellion against the Lord God. I wish it were possible for me to speak about what is happening in our professing Christian circles of our day. The National Council of Churches of the United States is systematically attacking Western civilization. The things that are transpiring in the religious circle are things that are contrary to the Word of God. Just recently, as we are anticipating as a country the celebration of the 500th year birthday of the discovery of the U.S., the National Council has written that uh, what we are celebrating is not the discovery of America, but something quite different. Columbus didn't discover America. He, our religious leaders who claim to be representative of vast millions of the United States say he didn't discover America, he invaded it. His voyage of exploration did not open this region of the world to European civilization, Christianity, and to the marvel called the United States of America, but to, quote, church-supported racism, genocide, exploitation, moral decadence, enslavement of Indians, and terrible injustices to Africans and the peoples of Asia. These are the individuals who, to, for, to whom... Um, we are looking supposedly for spiritual direction. 
Saul's slay the priests reminds me of the inevitable results of sin. It's striking to me that in the 17th verse, when, Paul call, when Saul called upon them to turn and kill the priests of the Lord because their hand was with David, the servants of the king would not lift their hands to strike the priests of the Lord. They themselves sense that there was something wrong about this and in effect anticipated Peter, we ought to obey God rather than men and refuse to obey the order. Doeg, however, did the job. And then David reflects upon it in verse 22 by saying, I have caused the death of all the persons of your father's house. Isn't it interesting how God's providence works? It might seem striking to us that this should happen, but do you remember in reading 1 Samuel, one of the things that God had said a long time ago through Samuel concerning Eli? He said to Eli, because you have not taken control of your children, you're going to lose the priesthood and you're going to lose your life. And so the prophecy is fulfilled here. And the 85 priests are slain. Slain by Doeg and his henchmen, perhaps. But nevertheless, the Word of God carried out and carried out in detail. Our times are in the hands of the Lord. And it's well for us to remember that, my Christian friends. God's providential judgment upon Eli's house was a judgment for failure to do what David did, that is, to honor his father and his mother. And because he did not take charge of his children, he suffered the consequences of this judgment. Now, for the remaining 10 minutes, I'd like to reflect upon the typological interpretation of these events. There is a parallel, I think, to the present ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and particularly his present rejection. Let me just illustrate the things or set them forth in the form of a series of things. Saul is the rejected king, but he's still on the throne. We live today as a result of the fall in the Garden of Eden. We live today under the king of this world the God of this age, who is Satan. The true king is to come, the king who will sit upon the throne and rule and reign. The whole world at the present time lies in the evil one or under his sway, as, for example, the New, King's Ver New King James Version translates it, under his sway. So we, too, live under a rejected king. Secondly, David, the typically true king, was divinely called and victorious over Goliath, illustrative of the conquest that our Lord Jesus made when he came and died upon Calvary's cross, and there, and dying upon the cross, won the control and the dominion over the whole of the earth. And the picture of David with the giant's head in his hand. And taking the giant's head up to Jerusalem is a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, who in dying for sin overcomes Satan and in resurrection advances to the throne of God and there with the giant's head in his hand rules and reigns and ultimately will come in his second advent to manifest the position that he now has as the anointed king over the whole of this universe. David, in kin killing Goliath, proved Gene Green's word that two heads are better than none. But that's an incidental lesson that one finds in the story. Thirdly, David is the true king, but he's persecuted by Saul who is the rejected king. And so today, satanic opposition to the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ abounds, and even the apostles express it. 
Paul speaks about having been hindered in his ministry, and we are dealing in a time in which the true king, anointed, soon to come, is nevertheless persecuted by Saul and his followers, the rejected king. David, fourthly, the true king, gathers followers to himself. And in the cave of Adullam, as we have mentioned, those who were discontented, those who were in debt, those who were in distress are gathered to David just as today the work of the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the gospel is to gather the Gentiles into the church of Jesus Christ. Now, incidentally, when he says to take out of them a people for his name, he's not talking only about Gentiles, but this is the day when the apostle's ministry, for he was anointed as the apostle to the Gentiles, is carrying out his ministry. And when those Gentiles are brought into the body of Christ, the church, let us never forget, they are brought in and united with the remnant of believing Israel. We are talking about a church composed of Jews and Gentiles, and we have said, and we affirm it again, that no one will ever get to heaven except through Abraham. Those promises that were given to Abraham, confirmed to David, confirmed in the new covenant, accomplished when the Lord Jesus died on Calvary's cross, are the fundamental promises. But today, as a result of Israel's rejection, Having been set aside for a time, the gospel has gone out and the great multitudes of the Gentiles have come into the body of Christ. So, the true king gathers followers to himself, and we, if we are believers in him, are part of his people. And fifthly, David's followers owe their life to him. Just as David's individual friends owed their life to his defeat of Goliath, the great Philistine giant. So we are individuals who owe our spiritual life to the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ and the victory on the cross at Calvary. And fundamentally, it is a redemptive thing. Always remember those marvelous words that Principal Denny once wrote. I'd rather preach with a crucifix in my hand and the feeblest power of moral reflection than to have the finest insight into ethical principles and no son of God who came by blood. In other words, the fundamental spiritual reality is the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus on Calvary's cross. All ethical principles are subordinate to that and in fact are dependent upon that. And we cannot have true biblical ethics if we do not have the fundamental fact of divine redemption through the blood shed on Calvary's cross. David's followers describe so beautifully the followers of Christ in distress. That's what we are. That word means something like oppressed. But nevertheless, in distress. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, Jesus said. In debt, we are in debt to such an extent that we could not by any means pay the debt that we have. For the wages of sin is death, and we cannot pay those wages. We cannot do that. We need someone to pay them for us, and that our Lord has done and discontented. The Hebrew text means something like embittered in soul. The unsaved are always discontented. Have you ever noticed that about them? Always discontented. And if you look back at your life, that described it before you came to Christ. Some years ago I read of a Christian Quaker who once often spoke to his neighbors about their souls but they all thought they were well enough off and didn't need the Christian Quaker to encourage them to come to God. They imagined that they were very contented on their own. And so one day this Quaker had the following sign set up in a 10-acre tract that he owned alongside 
a particular road. And the sign on the lot said, I will give this field to anyone who is really contented. And soon one of the most prosperous neighbors came along and said, hello, what's this? He read the sign. He said, I'll claim the field. If there's anybody contented, I'm contented. I have one of the finest farms in the country, or in the county. It's been paid for years ago. I have a fine nest egg in the bank. That wouldn't be such a reason for contentment today, but nevertheless, it was in his day. My children are all in excellent circumstances and doing well. I enjoy the best of health. I'm surely contented. So he went to the Quaker's door and he demanded the field. Ah, friend, said the Quaker, and this reflects the way they used to speak, if thee is contented, what does thee want of my field? And he convinced him that he really wasn't contented. So discontented, Jesus, thou art enough, the mind and heart to fill. That's true happiness. When a person realizes in having the Lord Jesus Christ, he has the ground for true contentment. No matter what our circumstances may be, we have the ground for true contentment. How marvelous it is to know that fact. And finally, David's followers are trained by association with the rejected king. These 400 who escaped to him later increased by others by association with David become what Scripture calls his mighty men. As a matter of fact, they become the sons of the kingdom. And that is precisely what we become as we associate with him, his mighty men. I don't know, some of you in this audience, you're already mighty men and mighty women, I think. You belong to that crowd. You have, in your fellowship and communion with the Lord Jesus, been brought to that state of spiritual growth and development, and some of you are not. And some of you don't even belong to our Lord, probably. The exhortation that is proper for each of us surely should come home to us. May I conclude with this. What we need, then, is some kind of decision. There was need at that time for decision, just as there's need for decision now. Which king shall I serve? Love for David meant rejection, but ultimately reward. Love for Christ means rejection. It does. It really does. If one truly is united to him, it means rejection. You will find it out but it also means reward. I like that story of one of Napoleon's disciples. His soldiers were once marching through the streets of Paris when their general's cause was questionable, hung in balance. A working woman named Jeanette seized a broom as they were passing and putting it to her shoulders fell in line with the troops and marched with them. And the bystanders were laughing and they asked her if she expected to fight with the broom. No, said Jeanette, but I can show which side I'm on. And so she publicly put herself on the side of Napoleon and his, so and his soldiers. I began the message by referring to a text, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. What a marvelous description of our Lord. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. In the original text, the word that is used is a word that means not simply to receive. It really means something like to welcome. It's a very strong word. Thras decatai, to welcome. He welcomes sinners to himself. He does not patronize. He takes us to his heart. He's not on the throne now. As a matter of fact, he's by you in the pew to welcome you if you come to him. He welcomed Mary of Magdala, uncontaminated by the seven devils that had inhabited her body. He welcomed the woman that was a sinner, not touched by her sexual sin. 
He welcomed John Bunyan, the swearing tinker. Mary becomes the first proclaimer of the resurrection, the one out of whom came seven devils. And Bunyan, called by one expositor of the word of God, the celestial dreamer. May I close by reading a beautiful poem. Behold a stranger at the door, he gently knocks, has knocked before, has waited long, is waiting still. You use no other friend so ill. But will he prove a friend indeed? He will, a very friend in need. The friend of sinners, yes, tis he, with garments dyed at Calvary. Admit him, ere his anger burn, lest he depart and ne'er return. Admit him, or the hour's at hand, when at his door denied you'll stand. Admit him, for the human breast ne'er entertained so kind a guest. No mortal tongue their joys can tell with whom he condescends to dwell. My prayer for you is that you admit him. Let's stand for the benediction. Father, we are so grateful to Thee for the ways in which we find our Lord Jesus Christ anticipated, illustrated, and then with us in Scripture, with us in saving grace, with us through the Spirit in all of the comforts and consolations that we need as we pass through this life, with all of the strength that we need. We thank Thee, Lord. We thank Thee for the greatness of the Son of David, who, though not yet manifested, is at Thy right hand, ruling and reigning. We pray, Lord, that we may show our true colors by coming to Him, allowing Him to reside in our hearts in the fullness of His power, and glorifying his name. And Lord, if there should be some here who do not know him at this very moment, touch their hearts and draw them to him whom to know is life eternal. For Jesus' sake, amen. Mm -hmm.